this week's episode is brought to you by Lumoid. Lumoid is a try-before-you-buy service for all sorts of consumer electronics. From camera gear and drones to fitness trackers and audio equipment, they have an extensive collection of gear, and you can check them out at lumoid.com slash photorectv. This week, new Lumoid customers can save 15% off their rental by using the code PHOTOREC15. And by viewers like you. Visit photorec.tv slash support to learn how you can support this show and join our community of photographers. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Photo Mishmash. I'm Christina. And I'm Toby. And this is episode 89. Nice to have you with us again. Welcome back. I'm Toby, photographer and educator. And I'm Christina, I'm a full-time wedding photographer. And every show we bring you the week's news, Instagram challenges, photography discussions, and at the very end of the show we answer your questions live. So if you have a photography related question, add it to the chat throughout the show and we'll be collecting the best ones to read at the very end. I put the title of this show, Instagram, oh no. Or you could say, oh no, Instagram because they released some news this week about some upcoming changes that I think are a bummer. And based on your Facebook comments when I posted about this last night, you agree. We're also gonna be talking about, uh, or wondering, actually I didn't put it in the show notes, but I put it to what we're gonna talk about. Is Canon really working on a 4K mirrorless camera that will be out this year? Hmm, we'll talk about that briefly. And um, the GH4 has got a firmware update coming that pushes it even further into the future. What am I talking about? We'll talk about those things, and as Christina said, answer your questions, share a, in this case, time-lapse from space, and your Instagram forced perspective photos. Yep, so we're going to get started. In case you missed it last week, there was a, an article on photoreg.tv about the best budget lens for astrophotography, mm -hmm. and that is the Rokinon 14 millimeter lens. Go check that article out, photorec.tv. It's a video and an article. So it's a review. I love it when you have no idea what's happened on the channel in the past week, but you know, that happens. Uh, it is a video review of the Rokinon 14 millimeter F2.8 lens, all manual lens that I've found to be awesome for shooting stars. Took it to New Zealand, took it to the Everglades. Very nice. Now. Once I published that though, a lot of people said, what about this, this, this? There are a lot of alternatives in that kind of budget category. Um, so I listed them all out and gave you the pros and cons of them and it's all there together in a nice little article. Remember all the show notes we're talking about are linked right down below all of the articles in case you missed it and all of the news stories as well. So another article that I posted and we actually put this in the news and you've probably seen it, Matt Granger published a video this week about quitting Sony. And his reason for, we'll just spend a moment on this, because I did talk about this in my review of the Sony a7R, which is just sitting over there right now. Um, his service and support experience in Australia, where he is based, has been terrible. And for a pro, Christina, would you agree that it's important when your gear breaks that you be able to get it fixed quickly and properly? Yeah, absolutely, this is incredibly yeah. important. So he's done with using them as his pro gear. Um, and you know, in the US, it seems I've heard from people that they're pretty satisfied with the customer service they've received from Sony. I haven't had to use them yet, despite dropping my camera once and survived that. Um, I do know that they were very slow to respond to me to get into that whole gear support system in the first place, which is a little disappointing. I had to talk to somebody at PPE. But um, yeah, that's certainly something to consider when you are buying into a system and an ecosystem. How is that support where you are? And that's one of the reasons why Canon's market share is as good as it is and is even beating Nikon in many places in the world because they put in place good repair systems and here in the in the U.S., you you are a CP, what is it? CPS member. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and what what does that give you? Not much. <laughs> Just you pay like a hundred dollars, and then I guess they return the equipment to you fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, the turnaround. I thought the turnaround time was quite good. Yeah. Okay. Depends what level you belong to. Okay. So, but there you are capable of having a very fast turnaround if you pay enough. Because um, we are talking about out-of-warranty repairs, but even within warranty, of course, as well. 
So that was uh, an interesting thing from him. It's linked there in the show notes. You should go watch his 16 minute video. He talks about that in more depth. Another article that I put up this week, it's a very short one. We've heard the rumors forever, but now we have final confirmation here in the US. The NX1 from Samsung is now listed as discontinued on B&H's website. That is the, um, was it the body only or the, the kit lens? I can't remember which one. Uh, one of them is not. That's the one with the kit lens. Uh, they do still have stock of the body only. Now down to $10.99. That is a big price drop from where it was originally. It's clear that Samsung is done for now with the system. It's unlikely that they're going to be coming back anytime soon. We know people who bought into the system. Um, and It's a nice system. Yeah, I, I mean, well, we shouldn't say that. It's not a nice system. It is a nice camera with a couple nice lenses, but not much. Well, and my friend Micah, he who has it, um, he's not super bummed because he can just get some older uh, vintage lenses to use with it. So he's actually quite happy because he probably wouldn't be buying the hmm. Samsung lens lenses anyway if they existed. I guess if they were good enough, maybe, but. Well, they are very good, but he, I mean, we should clarify, he is a videographer and he is happy to manually focus. Oh, sure. So, you know, That's very true. Um, but there are other people who do like autofocus. This is one of the things I heard at the Sony event. It was very interesting to be there. It wasn't just photographers that were there, photographers. It was also videographers. Um, and to hear them kind of, not really argue, but a little bit of tense discussion between, oh, I never use autofocus and some people saying, hmm, well, I sometimes use autofocus when shooting video professionally. Uh, so I really feel like that camp of always manual focusing is decreasing. There are some people who are embracing. The NX1 had amazing focus tracking with that touch to focus that worked very well and reliably. Uh, and you know, the Sony systems and Canon's dual pixel is all quite good and there are some people relying on that professionally. But, what was my point? Oh. What I think part of the killed the NX1 is no smart adapters. There are no adapters that transfer electronic control, stabilization, although it had stabilization in the camera, um, or focus. So any, you know, it, vintage lenses, sure, that's fine. But if you wanted to put any modern lenses on there and have those features, not so much. Correct. So, and... What else did I put in case you missed Last it? but not least, there is a video on uh, basic three-point lighting setup. You should definitely go watch that if you haven't already. Uh, go to photoric.tv and uh, watch the YouTube video on the website. It is great. It was actually developed and written by our, our assistant Riley, it's our right producer there. Riley. Thanks, Riley. Uh, he did an amazing job, and I think it's an awesome, awesome tutorial that is packed full of really helpful information if you've ever wondered how to light an interview or how to light a portrait or anything like that. This is, this is a great tutorial to look at. So go do that. Not right now. After the show. Um, yeah. It's short, short and sweet, and it's got good education in it and good vocabulary as well. All right, what's next, Christina? So we're going to move on to gear on the table. What do you have for us today? Gear on the table. Uh, those of you who follow along on the Facebook, you got to see. I've been posting some shorter video bits to Facebook from time to time, and uh, this arrived from the 3DR. Oop, I accidentally turned it on, I think. Uh, from the 3DR solo guys this week. So I'm really excited to have a real drone to fly around for a while. And I watched the How to Fly It video twice. It's about five minutes long. And then I felt very comfortable to go out and fly it. Um, I'm impressed with it. It does seem to move around within its little GPS bubble more than the DJI. But I'm going to go fly with somebody else who has got a comparable DJI uh, sometime in the next week to give you kind of my side-by-side -side thoughts. Um, and I can blame that kind of movement around in the bubble and the wind for my one crash so far. Uh, again, you can watch that on Facebook, but the, the damage was only the props. Uh, but, you know, the, the strength of this, the selling point of the 3DR is that kind of smart cable cam and orbit that it all has plugged in on the app or on the um, little remote. And it does a really nice job. It was really easy. I took it up all by myself to this hiking spot where I wanted to shoot some B-roll uh, with a backpack. Uh, that's a review that's coming out soon. And it was so easy to put it at a point press A, fly it to the next point that I wanted it to end at, press B, and then there's a play button. And then it will just fly back and forth as long as you keep hitting play on there. It's 
kind of humming and making noise like it wants to do something right now. There we go. Um, so pretty cool, but I'll be bringing you more information about that. And do uh, you have any interest in flying it? Uh, meh, not really. Oh. All right, you just want to fly the little drone and break it. So. Pretty much. Okay. Uh, so that is cool, and then that's all for gear on the table. We have a T6S sitting here, but we're going to use that to demonstrate your next Instagram challenge, so stay tuned for that. But talking about gear, talking about different bits of gear, things like drones, um, we first have really exciting news. We can announce the winner of the GoPro that we uh, partnered up with Lumoid to offer. So, and he's actually in the chat right now. Brian! Congratulations, Brian. He's down there in Fort Worth, Texas. He's about to go on his honeymoon to Cozumel. That's very exciting. Congratulations. Um, and the GoPro Hero 4 is going to be an awesome thing to bring along. If you saw, I rented that from Lumoid. That's why we're giving it away kind of like Toby rented it. You get to have it um, for uh, the Fiji trip and shot a lot of that underwater footage. And uh, it's just a fun little camera. So glad you're in the chat room. So glad you won. That's awesome. Thanks to Lumoid for giving that away and for sponsoring the show. So if you're looking at this drone sitting on the table and thinking, I've got a project coming up where I could get a little bit of aerial footage. You could buy a drone for $1,000, figure out how to fly it, or you could rent a helicopter, or you could rent a drone operator and a drone, or you could just rent a drone from Lumoid. They've got the 3DR Solo. They've got a smaller version as well. Let me pull that page up uh, and show you all of the different drone options they have. And they've got a little bit of a sale going on as well right now too. So you can click on drones and you can try, as they say, amazing gear. So they've got the DJIs. They've got the fun, the ones that are a little bit more toy-like, like the Parrot, um, the Parrot Mini Drone. If you want to try these out and see if they'd be a fun present for your kid. I don't think you're going to actually be able to bring anything to, into the house and try it out kid-wise without like saying you have to keep it. But that's the great thing about Lumoid because your kid says, I really want this. Some of the credit of renting that goes towards purchasing it as well. And of course, they've got the DJI Phantom 3, the DJI Inspire, which is a very serious, very fast drone, the 3DR Solo, and extra bits as well that you might want. So all of that's there. And of course, GoPros, if you need to get that for the 3DR Solo. All of that's available for you to try. A couple of days, you rent it, you can figure out whether it's gonna work for you or use it for a certain project. Uh, we've had folks in our support group that have rented the 70 to 200, kind of find out how well that lens works for them. And I found out, okay, maybe the 70-200 f2.8, that is a heavier lens than I wanna carry around for the day if I'm not shooting professionally. And then the 70-200 f4 is just right for me. So when you're trying to figure out what next piece of gear you need. A place like Lumoid is great because you get to try it, and then if you like it, those credits go towards buying it. We thank them for their support. Yes, thank you, Lumoid. All right. Um, yes, and you can save. Oh, we should put the code up too as well. New renters to Lumoid can save 15% off their first purchase, or sorry, first rental, by using coupon code PHOTOREC-TV15. It's just no. PHOTOREC-15, Thank actually. you, it's just PHOTOREC-15, as you see on the screen. All right, let's talk a little bit about news. Yep, so first up is um, news that Affinity Photo is coming to Windows. I had never heard of Affinity, <laughs> but apparently it is a photo editing software. It's a little bit cheaper than uh, Photoshop, and it's available without a subscription service. So sounds like it's more accessible, it's pretty feature-packed, and it was developed for Macs, so um, seems like it's probably pretty, pretty good, pretty fast. Um, and it's coming to Windows now. So if you've been waiting for Affinity to come to Windows, right, a lot is. cheaper than buying Photoshop outright. Which you actually can't even do that anymore, can you? Um, unless you're kind of like an educational institution, I think you have to rent it. So if you don't like the idea of renting, um, fifty bucks is what it's going to be offered as, and it looks as full-featured uh, as Photoshop for what most of us need to do. You know, you can edit video in Photoshop, you can do serious 3D, I shouldn't say serious, you can do 3D modeling. There's a lot of stuff you can do in Photoshop. How many of us ever really need to do that? How many of us just wanna kinda tweak a picture from time to time? So this looks like a nice alternative. I'm glad for that. 
Yeah. Um, next, uh, next Canon prosumer level camera, mirrorless camera, is going to have 4K. So oh, it which... is good. It is in the news. I forgot that it was there. Thank you for Roy for getting it in there. So this is from Canon Rumors. We just have this mock-up of a possible mirrorless camera. We're told that we're going to have three mirrorless cameras coming in 2016. Um, at least one of those is supposed to feature 4K video recording, though the size of the image sensor is unknown. You want to make any predictions about this? Nope. All right. Well, first off, Canon does have mirrorless already. They got their EOS M series lenses or uh, can cameras. Um, they're really unexciting. They've sold terribly here in the U.S. Their AF system is, um, it's not horrible, but it's certainly not on par with something like the A6000 or definitely not with the newer A6300. And their lens selection is pretty small, but you can, of course, get an EF-M to EF-S adapter. They're just underwhelming. I am not terribly excited about this announcement. I don't think Canon is gonna manage in this next round to really pull out a mirrorless camera that makes me go, wow. But, I mean, they could. What, what if they, Christine, what if they did a full frame mirrorless um, that, you know, your nice 85 can fit on and worked really well? Um, I just don't really have interest. Why not? Because I, I think if I were to get a small camera for it to be small, then I would just get something that, you know, I wouldn't be carrying the 85 millimeter. Okay. I would just have something small. Not good to match up, right, yeah. Yeah, I guess, and so, I mean, if it shoots 4K, uh, I, I, here's my prediction. The, if there is a 4K this year, and I think that's possible towards the end of this year from Canon, uh, that it will be one of the smaller format sensors, similar to the Sony RX, or well, maybe not that small, but smaller. I do not see them putting a 4K in a full frame sensor, probably not even an APS-C. I don't think so. All right, next story. Uh, so Sigma claims to have released new firmware that makes the 150 to 600 millimeter, I believe this is the contemporary version, up to 50 times faster. So that's it's already pretty fast, I believe. Um, so it, it was decent. This is actually for the sport or contemporary. This will this firmware will update either. Uh, you know, it, it was speedy. It's certainly not as speedy as the 100 to 400, which we found just be a blazing fast focusing machine paired with a nice fast camera. Uh, but this is this is nice improvements. This is kind of the answering that question last week. We talked about why do lenses need firmware? Because the scientists and engineers come up with algorithms that say no, move that gear that way, that's much faster, and then it focuses faster. Uh, and we reap the benefits from it. So that is exciting. It's, it says it looks like in normal conditions between 20 and 50% faster. I, I probably in real world use, you might notice that. It doesn't seem like a huge amount. It's not like twice as fast, but still it's an improvement. And this is nice that we're getting updated firmware for lenses that improve their speed and focusing. It's good. I like that. Uh, you know, what's not in the rundown, I think we mentioned it last week, but I didn't know this at that time, that Sigma adapter that is coming out that allows people to use Canon, or sorry, Sigma lenses on Sony does allow for the IAF to still work and the focus tracking, which even the Metabone's latest T version does not, but the wow. Sigma does. That's very interesting. Good job, I Sigma. I am excited to try the 50 millimeter F1.4 on the Sony with that adapter. I'm on the list to get a review unit. Soon, I hope. Soon, I hope. So. Great. Next, the, um, I guess Venus Optics has created a new 105 millimeter f2 lens. It's called the Laowa. And it uses a special element for crazy smooth bokeh. I have to say, I looked at the sample images, and I am not loving that bokeh element whatever that element they're using is just... I want to hear you pronounce that. Uh, no. <laughs> I think it's apodization element. Uh, basically, I think you can think of this element as vignetting the bokeh in such a way that you uh, 
Um, you don't see kind of onion rings. Bad bokeh is onion rings. In those little bokeh balls, Julina, your daughter's watching, remember? Uh, you, you've got sometimes, in some lenses, you've got these kind of onion rings. You can see rings around the edge of the bokeh that is pretty hard. In, in each bokeh ball, you'll have, or bokeh, if you want to be picky or correct, actually. Um, it's, it's in there, and that really bothers some people. Uh, this element seems to diminish the light out towards the edges and that then diminishes or smooths the bokeh for very creamy. So you you're you don't love it? Is there some you you have this eye that you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to admit I don't think I do. I am a lot less picky. You notice something you'll say um you know, I'm picky about like if something's shot with a wide angle lens, I can see that distortion. But there are things you say about certain lenses that until you say them I haven't noticed. Uh in this one, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, it doesn't look amazing. Riley, we got some samples we can, I don't know if you showed these yet. Um, it, it just doesn't have any character to it. It no. just looks cloudy. It looks soft. Um, it looks, I don't know, in a way it kind of, like some of the pictures look like maybe they were shot with Oops. like a larger, larger format camera, but I don't know. I just, it doesn't have that really nice, crispy, like round quality. Can you even call this bokeh? I feel like bokeh are the hmm. shapes of the, the sort of circles or hexagons or whatever shapes that the aperture ring makes when you're taking these photos in the backgrounds, backgrounds blur. This almost doesn't have that at all. Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just not a fan. Uh, Dave, you know, David brings up a good point, and I was just about to make this. I mean, uh, attractive bokeh is very subjective. There may some people that look at this and go, ooh. Oh, sure. Yeah. Cloudy, creamy. I love it, just like my coffee. And you may look at it and say, I'm kind of cloudy, and I uh, just don't like it very much. As uh, you have. Yeah, and Scozia in the chat says, sort of looks like Photoshop blur. Yes, that is exactly what mm. it looks like. Thank you. That yep. is what I was trying to convey. Say, okay. And... Um, yeah. I do like, the, it looks like they've updated the build quality a little bit of this. I have uh, sitting right out of reach their Venus Optics 60 millimeter macro lens, um, which I've been impressed with. Uh, its build quality is okay, and I also have um, loaned it out right now, but I have their Shift Tilt 15 millimeter super wide macro, um, and that's build quality. Mm. But this one's got some nice blue color on it. I like that blue color. Mm, sure, it makes uh, for great pictures. Yes. The, the, that's why they put the red ring on the L lenses, because that makes the pictures better. Um, and it's important to note that Sony's got a version of this as well. They've got a 135 millimeter version. Uh, it's manual focus as well, and it's 1400. So this one is a score at what, 600 it's gonna be? Somewhere it said it was 600, I thought. Also, I should say that Trulina just corrected me and said that anything that is blurred, so Blur, bokeh means blur. So I guess it, it, it is technically bokeh. I guess okay. I just always thought of like the, the circles. The shapes of the... Yeah, as bokeh, yeah. but okay. that's wrong. So. 699, 699 is what it's gonna be for. Okay. Now, we've got, maybe we should reach out to them after our Lumoid sponsorship is, is over. We've got a new company coming online that is changing gear acquisition. It's bringing a Netflix model to rental. This is interesting. They're called Parachute, I think. Um, I think it's really smart. They've left the E off and just put a little accent on the U to be cool. Uh, and the idea is you pay a Netflix-like monthly fee. In this case, it's $99 for the first month, $149 each month after that. It's pretty pricey. You tell them what you're interested in, what kind of gear bodies you already have, and what you um, might want. And then... Right now, it's kind of in this preview mode where you put all that in. You have to put your credit card information in, too. It's one of those things where I think they hope you forget, and then all of a sudden, you'll get a shipping notice that's like, you know, 99 bucks your first month. Here comes your gear, and it's not a great deal. Um, but uh, they send you some gear that kind of matches what you like to do. Photographer, videographer. They, um, on the page, let's go to Parachute here. Uh, they have... Um, you know, kind of, it's so it's hard to tell how Somebody much stuff is actually on their shelf. Someone here is saying that it's like it's basically a pyramid scheme. So, do you refer people? Is that how it works, or what? 
Because that's kind of the premise behind a pyramid scheme, isn't it? Like you sell to like three people and they sell to three people and they sell to three people and so on and so on and so on. But yeah. this doesn't sound like it. No, I don't think it's a pyramid scheme. All right, so maybe I should just take us through the profile thing. You complete your profile, which says kind of like what you like, drone sears too, accessories, lenses. Uh, then you receive your gear uh, and you receive targeted educational tools to learn how to use your gear. You keep the gear as long as you want and then you send it back with our prepaid shipping labels to try something new, no hassles. So what's the fine print on as long as you want? Because clearly you can't keep a 70 to 200 F2.8. Well, I guess as, if, as long as you're paying the monthly fee, maybe they'll right. let you keep it. Eventually it'll pay for itself. That's right. And then do you get to say, can I just keep keep it now? Or will they be like, nope, time to send it back. So there's, there's a lot of questions. I, I mean, I agree. I think it's a neat idea. I like this idea of it. They're going to be launching sometimes late this spring. Um, but I would like to see a real list of inventory of what might possibly be sent. And it's pretty pricey. But I understand that you might be getting good gear, then it's pretty pricey, but it's pretty pricey. And it probably makes some gear that you wouldn't otherwise have access to more accessible. So for example, like a medium format camera or some kind of like medium format film system that you just don't have the money to buy. I mean, I would pay $150 to get to use it for at least a month. Yeah, let's do quick math. Uh, I mean, let's, let's, let's think, it, so typically you can rent things for $150 for like about a week, you know, like yeah, when rent, you go yep, to yep. the rental places. Yep. So this is like, you can, you can rent for conceivably for a month, $150, pretty much like anything that they have on there. That seems like a really good deal. Yeah, you just made it sound much more appealing. You did. Um, you know, I just did a quick math, uh, like this, the 70 to 200, let's say you get your hands on the 70 to 200, uh, that is about $2,000. So if you kept that for a year, that's still 160 bucks a month, so that's still cheaper. But then, let's see, it's the leasing. So some of you like to lease cars out there. Some of you like to buy them outright. So, you know, hmm, depends. It's an intriguing idea, and I think it's nice. I think it's nice to have other options, like as you said, to access gear that you might not ever otherwise have available to you. I think the only limitation I see is finding people with the budget or who have the ability to budget for that every month. Like $150 is a significant amount. So if you're already gonna be spending money renting things, um, for example, if you own like a production company, a video production company like our friend Bryant, or you're a photographer that's constantly trying out gear and you end up spending more than $150 a month, then this is a really great deal for you. However, if you're somebody who doesn't do that, um, and uh, you are considering it, that's kind of a steep price to pay monthly um, and kind of hard to think that most people would be able to budget it. Um, but, you know, if you could do like one month though, that seems, if you could just like sign up for a month and then get some gear and then send it back, then that seems fine to me. Yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I've now read the article while you were talking here or, or read the uh, important pieces. Um, so what if you never want to return it? It's not a problem. It'll allow you to keep the gear for good at and at a discount. Uh, you know, the, the keys here, the, the, art, the person who wrote this article on Resource Mag Online says, uh, it's going to be um, filling the warehouse with the gear so that everybody gets something nice. I mean, how would you feel if you spent $99 the first month and the 50 millimeter F1.8 STM shows up? So they, you know, so it's not only going to be getting oh. good gear in and getting that Wait, good gear to people. So you don't get to choose what you get. Oh no, not exactly. No. Oh, oh, well, that changes everything. You can put down what you really would like, but you put this down in this little box. You don't go in like Lumoid and say, "Hey, I need oh, I next see. weekend the 70 to 200." No, you say, "Here are the lenses I would like." Now, maybe if you put only the 70 to 200, but see, then it feels like Netflix in the old DVD model. For those of you who actually ever rented the DVDs, where you had to say. This is what I want. And they're like, well, that's not available right now. You know, move it down your queue and something else has to move up. So you end up with like the 518 at the top of your queue. I don't mean to bash them. I'm just, as Trillina says, she likes the idea, but she's skeptical. It's the yeah. Same. I like the idea. I mean, I don't think I'm that they're going to be trying to scam people because otherwise that they would just stop paying. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, no, not a scam, but it's just to pull this off well is going to be difficult. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if there's like a minimum amount of stuff that you can have out at once 
or if it's just one piece of I gear? I think it's just one piece of gear. Well, see, then that includes all sorts of problems because what if you need a system or something? So do you have to pay twice now? Mm. Um, Good questions that we need to find the answer to. Can I put you on this research process? Mm. Will you sign up? Nah. I, I went through all the way through the sign-up process until it was like, you have to give us your credit card. And I was like, not right now, I'm broke. So, sorry. I'll try again later. Or maybe I'll reach out and say, do you have a, can I try it out as a, as a reviewer and let my fans know about it? That's actually a really great idea. I know. I got a lot of great ideas. All right. Can we talk about the GH4 moving into the future? Uh, sure. Um, so it's funny, last, we've been filming, this is kind of a side, we've been filming with the GH4 again. Uh, we started when I went to Florida because I took the Sony with us, which is what we use to, you know, do this live show. Um, we used to use the GH4, but you know, we like that kind of full frame sensor. We're in a kind of smaller studio, but we switched back to the GH4, uh, with a speed booster. And we actually had a comment last week that was like, have you guys switched to a new camera? Cause it looks really good. I love this GH4. Its quality is fantastic. It's such a friendly camera to work with. And even though we've got the nice full frame Sony sensor over there, um, in controlled environments where the light is good, I am perfectly happy to use the GH4. And even when the light's not that good, I'm still kind of happy to use it. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's kind of aside from this. So it's coming, a new firmware is coming. now. This is why I say it's moving into the future. We have, what have we argued about in the future of photography in previous episodes? Do you remember, Christina? Uh, yeah, the idea of um, sort of taking out of the equation the fact that you have to capture photos and stills and just record a video and then pull out stills from the video. That's right. That is the future, ladies and gentlemen. I feel confident in saying that. There's been multiple signs. I'm not saying it's going to be here tomorrow or even next year, but there'll be a time where we're basically shooting video and we're pulling stills out of that for our photos. You can put all you want in the comments, all kinds of arguments. I love reading them. I do. Uh, but I believe that's what's coming. Just because it's coming and just because it's the future doesn't mean that you should do it. Just okay. thought I'd put that out yeah. there. We don't need to rehash all of our arguments about this. We both have, uh, I think you have excellent arguments about it, uh, as I do as well. I think my own arguments are excellent. Um, but here's what's coming. In this new firmware, you've got post focus. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Being able to focus after you take the picture? Yeah. What was that? Uh, those ugly cameras. Those ugly cameras. The Lytros, which have failed yep. miserably. Here's how it does it. So it's the same idea. You are basically running a video and you go to take a picture and it moves the focus point you know from like before your subject to after your subject takes a burst of pictures focus stacking almost but you don't actually ever stack them and then afterwards you can scroll through these images and as opposed to looking like images through time it's going to look like images with the focus point moving and so you can say oh that's where i nailed the model's eye or the duck flying, although I don't think you're really shooting the, a flying duck with a GH4, that's not its strength. But that's gonna allow you to then pull, pull that image out. It is gonna be an eight megapixel image because this is 4K, so it's not the 16 megapixel the camera can shoot. Uh, and there are some other issues there. We did this, I have prints, maybe somewhere still in this room, um, that I shot with the GH4 that I pulled out of a video file. And at those higher shutter speeds, they have a little look to them that's not great. But still, that's cool. And what else? Um, there is also three new or three modes to the 4K photo now: 4K burst, 4K burst start stop, and 4K pre burst. So, and it also has support for external flash burst, which makes the camera compatible with a number of flash units while doing continuous shooting. I'm curious how that works. Uh, there's no way these flashes can, can can keep up with 30 frames a second. So. I'd love somebody smarter to say how that's going to work, but... David says, it sounds like the ultimate form of spray and pray. Oh, well, yes, that's true to some degree. That is. Um, but I, there are, there are places where I can see this being useful. I think it's interesting that they've added it. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a GH5 this year. I mean, you could already do that with a GH4. You could already pull stills from it. Yes, it already had 4K photo mode, but they have now done the post-focus feature which is specifically, will it'll automatically move the focus point 
for you through like a subject um, or by a subject. Uh, and also they've changed, it sounds like, instead of just a burst, you can also do a 4K burst start stop. You probably hit it once to start, hit it again to stop. And a 4K pre-burst, which I believe means it might automatically be capturing a few frames, a few seconds before you go to take a picture all the time. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Because you know how many, okay, let's take the parent trying to get their kid eating broccoli for the first time and that adorable face. And they're like, oh, and they get the camera up. And just as they go to take the picture, the kid like spits it out. And then it looks like the kid never likes broccoli. And the kid uses that picture for the rest of their life as an example of why you force fed them broccoli. And they hate it. I just think that seeking perfection in imperfect moments like that is sort of unnecessary. But you're trying to capture that moment. Yeah, and you did. He spit out the food. No, but you want the part where he's got the funny face right before he spits it out. And now, this camera will let you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, GH5, January 2017. Uh, that sounds reasonable to me. This, I mean, the GH4 is, is fantastic. It's a uh, cat hair. You all miss Liam? He's someplace outside. Um, alive, probably sleeping. Um, because everybody's always wondering if Liam's alive. Oh, right. Okay. I was wondering why you were like specifying that. Um, okay. We're going to move on. So whoever does Nikon's <laughs> or this particular poster for Nikon has no idea what Nikon cameras look like because they used a Fuji camera um, as part of the ad, which is like really dumb. This, they got know. a Shutterstock image. Yep. And yeah. David Hobby, who is a great, uh, what, what's he run? Um, uh, uh, Strobist. Strobist. Uh, if you want to know stuff about Flash, he's a great guy to follow. Uh, you know, they just, this, this advertising agency, remember, none of these companies do this in-house. Very rarely do they do advertising in-house. Some advertising agency just grabbed a thing and didn't think that they were working for a camera company to talk about their camera roots and just grabbed a picture like, oh, there's an old camera. I'm sure it's a Nikon. I don't think they thought like, oh, there's just an old camera. So. That's pretty funny. This happens from time to time. The other good example I can think of was a Lumia commercial from a couple years ago where they were showing off, I think the Lumias were the first ones with that good optical stabilization in their cell phones. They were showing like, here's the person riding on the bike taking this amazing steady shot. And then they switched and showed the steady shot from the Lumia and it passes by a van and in the reflection you could see a gigantic steady cam because that was before the days oh. of the little ones. So it was like, mm, that was not shot with a Lumia, you dummies. Yeah. So it happens. I hate that though. Like I hate, that's just plain false advertising. Like freaking show what the actual camera does. Like I want to know what the camera does. I don't want to know what some steady cam can do. That's really, that annoys me. That's yep. really dishonest. Um, okay, last news piece is uh, some updated shipping dates for some new lenses, the Zoni, Battis, Loxia, Tamron, Voigtlander, and Sigma lenses. Um, I'm assuming that this is gonna be in the show notes so that people, if they're... Yeah, just click through. Things are coming. Everything feels like it's been pushed back a little bit. Most things have been felt like they've been pushed back a little bit. Um, but we've got some stuff. Uh, March 17th is that Sigma 30 millimeter E-mount lens that's just for crop sensors. I'm interested about that. I heard, talked to somebody the other day who I think had gotten their hands on an earlier copy and was not as impressed, but I'm still excited about it. Uh, the Sigma adapter, March 23rd, um, is when that should start shipping according to B&H. And we've got those Loxias, end of March, and you can read the, oh, but let's see. Oh, the 70 to 200 F2.8, which I got to touch at the Sony event. Um, I could have shot with it if I'd asked, but I didn't. I should have. Uh, no shipping date yet. Still no price to that. Uh, that's a little bit of a bummer. Come on, Sony, get that out. Uh, the Sony 24 to 70 G series, end of March as well. Uh, maybe beginning of April, depending on whether you're looking at B&H or Amazon. And that 85. Ooh, that 85 is nice. I'd be very happy with that. I'd be very. I, I'd like you to shoot that a little bit. Um, compare it to your 85 1.2. I was very happy with that lenses. These lenses are 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 nice. You're going to pay for them, but they're nice. Are we having this conversation during the discussion or what? Um, no, let's have it now. Okay. Oh, last news story before we get to our photos from space is the bummer and the show title, Instagram. Oh, no. So they announced this week that they are going to start making some changes to the feed. Currently, when you pull up your feed on Instagram, 
it is chronological. So there is the most recent post at the top and you scroll, 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 and you're going back through time. They're gonna change it to algorithmic. Does that sound familiar? Yep, it sounds very familiar. I knew, I knew Facebook was gonna screw Instagram up somehow. I knew it was gonna happen. In fact, I had a conversation with somebody with my friend Joe, I had a conversation about this like two days ago. I was like, you know, they own it, they're gonna screw it up somehow. And here they go, it's just the beginning. Yeah. It's nice while it lasts. Their, their reasoning, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt for a moment, is that most of us miss about 70% of our feed. Uh, I don't care. I go through my feed sometimes, like, like actually go through the end of it. Now I'm not, now I'm just gonna like, miss stuff period because well, it's not going to be there well no no no. okay hold on so uh, that's probably coming yes i feel that's coming but right now they made sure to say we're just going to change the order we are not going to hide anything at this time it's not that's not their exact language but basically all of the pictures all of the people you follow will be there it'll just be in a slightly different order based on what we think you like your interests yada 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 so but then you, you're not exposed to like things that you would encounter normally. Like that's, that's what the explore section is for so that you can go and see things that are suggested to you. Anyway, I know Instagram isn't, Facebook isn't I listening know. or anything. They should, they should give us an option. See your stuff chronologically or, and then people They do choose. that with Facebook. Yes, but even- I mean, it, I know it doesn't work. Right, it's BS and stuff still gets hidden. And so I feel like I'm, I'm bummed. Uh, because I, I've been really enjoying Instagram. I'll still enjoy it. I en enjoy growing my following. I enjoy posting pictures and getting feedback from people. Um, and it does feel like at some point in the future, if I'm going to want everybody to see a post, like sometimes I use it to post deals. Like yesterday, actually it's still going on today. You can get a good deal on the Sony Fast SD cards at B&H. Um, you know, I posted that. But I feel like in the future, Instagram's going to be like, eh, I don't think people are really interested in your deal. Yeah, exactly. All Give us some money. All they're getting to is like charging people right. money for stuff. So sound off in the comments. Chat like, room folks, uh, we love you. Uh, thanks so much for being in here with us. But just a reminder that all of your wonderful chattiness uh, goes away at the end of the show. So make sure you take a moment if you've got some, if you are fired up about this Instagram I'm a, stuff. I'm a little fired up about this because I have no problem like seeing ads and being sold stuff. Like I'm not one of those people that does ad block and stuff. I understand that like you need to make money to be able to run things and pay employees and whatever. My issue is like them trying to control what we see and, uh, and what we show people. That's my big issue. Like show me all the ads you want. Just like leave my feed exactly the way it is. It's so, I know, I know that I always complain like every, I don't know if you guys remember back when Facebook used to do all these like different changes like every month would be like oh the news feed is different and everybody would complain like ah oh, please bring it back and they would like have petitions and start groups and stuff I was like I get so annoyed at that it's like oh people fear change but I've actually you know I've seen what this has done to Facebook to to my Facebook feed and to my interaction with Facebook which to this day is like basically non-existent like I don't really use Facebook because of it um, and especially with my business like I don't even update my Facebook page because I know it's a total waste of time thanks a lot Facebook um, so yeah I have no problem with like them showing us ad and selling to us my big issue is just like them trying to control what we see which I don't feel like and I know that, you know, we sign an agreement that lets them do whatever the hell they want. And I can tell you're fired up because this is the most you've talked about anything so far other than the ugly, uh, ugly bouquet. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, just last thing to say, good thing you brought up the Facebook page thing because that is firsthandedly, I have felt like with 25, I'm almost got 25,000 followers on Facebook now. It feels like it means zero. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a post that seems to get organic traction and maybe a couple thousand of you will see it. But out of 25,000, that's pretty frustrating and a lot of posts I will see, maybe I should post more interesting stuff, but a lot of posts I see are in the low hundreds for number of people. What is that? Less than 1%? That is sad and a little frustrating. And the worst so, part okay. is that you can't even We're talk- We're starting to sound like old grannies. Get off my lawn, Instagram. Get off your own lawn. Anyway. The worst part is that like even if people are interested, even if people want to see, if, if you want to see posts from a page that you really like, you can't. 
You can't because Facebook controls it. So even if you tell it, yeah, show me posts from this page, it still doesn't work. Anyway, I'm going to shut up about it. But um, yeah, it's really sad because I, I have been enjoying Instagram and I have been enjoying the process of like growing it and stuff. And I think that's going to change. Yeah. Um, we got, uh, we're ready for the next segment? Yes. You ready for this? This guy, Mike, did this. Why is it still playing? Oh, that's because it's the back and around. Okay. Uh, Riley, if we can share my screen, I am going to show this. There was a solar eclipse on March 9th. So this is a time lapse from space. This is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to mute it. We don't need to hear it. It's just kind of some magical. Here is sunrise coming. This is um, over the kind of the Pacific Ocean. We can see Australia down at the bottom. And there, I'm going to pause it for a sec. Ooh. That black blob moving across the surface of the Earth. I'm going to back it up a little bit for you. Um, is the eclipse. There it goes. That is awesome. Again, not to talk about the Sony event so much, but it was fun to meet other people, the other things there. This guy, um, Eric, um, is a big kind of astronomy nut. I don't know, nut might be too strong a word, but he's really excited because next year, in the fall, there is a total solar eclipse that's happening here in the western, kind of actually it goes from the western U.S. down to the southeast. Some people think that the best viewing, you know, your chance of lo lowest number of clouds will be west of the Rockies. People are gearing up to like camp out in Oregon to capture this. Uh, it looks pretty cool. Um, it just there's some neat things that happen as an eclipse goes on. So I'd like to experience that. So road trip. All right. So that was our photos from space. Now what do we do? Oh, I know what we do. We tell you briefly that you can travel with me to Alaska this fall. Now, there is a connection to very recent news. The Iditarod just finished up. Who was the winner? Dallas CV. Who will you hang out with besides me if, we go, if you go to Alaska with me next fall? The Iditarod champion. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. The McKay's already did this trip last year and had an awesome time. I saw their pictures. They went on this dog sledding expedition with a former Iditarod champ. You know, I, I, I do kind of like pay attention each year when the Iditarod's happening and I think for a few minutes, man, I bet that's really cold. Those guys are pretty tough, but I don't spend much more time thinking about it. And then I saw David Post, you know, yay, our friend won. That's who they hung out with. Not some old retired champion, but the guy who won last year, the guy who won this year, we're going to go dog sledding with the champion of like one of the most grueling sled dog races in the world. That's amazing. thought that's pretty cool. That's super cool. So uh, just a reminder, you can have, you have opportunities to travel with me Alaska this coming fall, uh, right before winter. It's like end of November. And then in July 2017, Iceland, we're going back. And if there is one place that offers the most mind-boggling, amazing landscapes to photograph and to just enjoy, it's Iceland. So we'll put those links down in the show notes so that you can join us and uh, it's going to be a good time. Those trips are always so much fun. We talked last uh, time about how we've made uh, lifelong friends on these trips. So uh, we want you to join them. Come along. Now what? Now we get to talk about the Instagram challenge. Okay. So last week was Forest Perspective. Yep. And uh, why don't you take it away? Okay. So um, this is a toughie. I didn't even participate. You didn't participate. I feel a little crummy about that. But you all did some really nice shots. The idea that kind of I gave uh, for Forest Perspective was that a little bit of cliche of like, you know, um, pinching the uh, Washington Monument or holding something in your palm. A couple of you did some things like that, but there were some good ones. Uh, Christina, you're gonna go first with your first honorable mention. Um, this is by Karmatic Photography. Mm -hmm. And um, it's cool because this boat is clearly in the ocean on water, but because of the perspective, it looks like it's just parked on a bunch of gravel uh, or rocks or whatever. So I appreciated that. I like the composition. I like the time that it was shot at. It looks like it was like sunset. Um, so it's nice. Nice all yeah. around. Good job. Very nice. I like it too. Your second 
pick. I'm going to, is this the bean? This is the bean, isn't it? No. He, oh, it's not? No, he's just holding a, a glass ball in his hand. Oh, well. It does, ha it does look inside. It, it looks, looks like, like the, the bean. bean oh. So that's why I liked it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I like the tones in the image. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little crunchy, uh, but, but I like it. Yep. Nice shot. Okay, very nice. Let's give it a like. Uh, and then your winner. That's pretty cool. Uh, if you title... Oh, it's by the same person. Ah, uh, yeah. I noticed that when I was putting them together. You didn't notice when you picked? No, I just, okay. I don't look. I just... Hey, a winner and an honorable mention. Both karmatic photography, you rock. Uh, would, what would you give this as a title? Uh, I don't know. I'm not a very creative person when it comes to titles. Moon Crane. Mm. Moon Crane. That's what I would call it. All right. Those are wonderful. Thank you. And now, uh, my first one is from Nancy Kachia. Uh, do you recognize this, Christina? Yes, that is the Eiffel Tower. I, I love this perspective. So, you know, I, you know, I don't quite know if it falls in the forced perspective category, but it is just enough um, that you can identify what this is, or you should be able to, I think. Um, but without being obvious and hitting you over the head with it. And I, you framed and lined up those lines so nicely. Nice job. I really like that. So I give a little heart there. And then IMP64. I saw this. Remember, I picked these. I think you do the same. You just look at thumbnails that catch your eye. And then you say, oh, yep. you pull it bigger and you look at it. The same thing. I was like, this caught my eye. I love the tones. Mm. I kind of like the color. Roy actually came up with an even better title for that. Uh, Wrecking Moon. Ooh. That's moon. a good that title, Roy. Miley Cyrus song. Okay. Yes, it does. Um, That's why it's awesome. So, and then I, I'm looking at it, and then I looked over and I saw the hashtags diorama, and I was like, oh, those are not real. But I think the stuff in the background is. So this is this is close to a winner for me. Um, but I ended up putting in honorable mentions because, but I love it. I love it. It's fantastic. I, w I went with Roger's shot of these two seagulls that are, I believe, to be the exact same size, but because one is so much further, they look like they're kind of like fighting with each other and it's so much smaller. It's and very cool for I you. love it. Nice job, Roger. Thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, you know, we had folks you should, um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I was gonna show some of the other ones uh, real quick to scroll through, but I think, I don't think we have enough quick time. Hey, we have two more than when I looked a little while ago. Remember, folks, you're supposed to get those in by noon each day. So I like this one with the candle as well, um, right behind there. There's some that I wasn't quite so sure about. This is so simple, this image right here. Very nice. That makes it a strong image. I like that. I also like these star trails. I couldn't quite figure out forced perspective in any way for this, um, but I do like that. Oh, he's holding a little shadow. Mm. And this image stood out to me too. Again, not a um, so much forced perspective, but yeah. it's very sharp. And um, a lot of the images were really great, um, but they just didn't really fit with the theme so much. So but, I didn't choose them. But you've got the circular, uh, circling uh, helicopter around circling? World Trade. Circling, the helicopter was circling, orbiting. 3DR Solo has an orbit mode. Uh, so I just really nice V Baobab. So we've got some great shots in there. Thank you so much. All right, Christina, um, let's talk about next week's Instagram challenge. And we have to demonstrate something here. So next week's challenge is freelancing. And for those of you who don't know what freelancing, it, lensing, freelancing, um, it is a creative technique um, that you can use in order to get a tilt shift effect um, on some of your images. So in order to create that effect, in order to um, use freelancing, what you have to do, and some of you are going to cringe, so do it at your own risk, whatever. That's right. We're not responsible for anything that happens, and we're going to follow this up next week with a next week challenge called Dirty Spots on My Sensor, because... So, um, and then, it, yeah. It, so you yeah. separate your lens from the camera, and essentially what you do is you you bring it back so that it's touching the mount, so that both mounts, so this mount is touching the camera mount. Um, and then you very, very gently angle the lens one way or the other until you find a focal point. Couple tips for this, do it in live view. 
it's going to be way easier uh, to get started in Live View um, than it is going to be through the viewfinder. If you don't have an optical viewfinder, then don't you don't have a choice. Um, but it can create a really cool effect, um, something different. Uh, it's a really cheap way to create a, a tilt shift effect in camera, um, you know, without having to use Photoshop, although you can certainly do that as well. Um, yeah, and it's just fun. Uh, it also introduces like lots of really cool light leaks. So, um, you know, you should maybe experiment with portraiture. Like I think there can be some really cool portraits made by using this. Um, some like, yeah, I mostly like the light leaks. Um, so yeah, that's the challenge I got, for this I week. got one more additional tip for Canon users. Uh, you've got this little depth of field. So first I should step back up. When you take this lens off, it automatically opens up to its widest aperture, whatever that is. 518, it's going to open up to 18. Your kit lens is going to open up to 35, unless you zoom uh, a little bit. But if you want to shoot at an aperture other than its widest, so maybe you don't want to at f1.8 with this, maybe you want to shoot at f2, you can put it on f2. I've got the T6S here. You hold down the little aperture preview button, and I'm going to put this real close to my mic for a sec. Hear that little click? That is the aperture stopping down. Now, if you hold that button down and disconnect the lens, it will stay there at that f2 mark. The, the aperture is frozen. So then you can work with an aperture that's not. And you know, play around with it. See, see how far away from the camera you can get it. You can turn live view on. There's live view right now. There's a picture of Christina um, with no lens. It's a good picture. Uh, or you can just kind of hold the lens there and move it around some. Experiment with that. Free lens. So the actual hashtag you'll be using is hashtag PRTV underscore free lens. F-R-E-E-L-E-N-S. Uh, another tip, do it with a widish lens, like a 50 or a 35, especially if you have a crop sensor camera. It's going to be kind of challenging to get focus if you're really far away. Yeah, so. yeah. That's another place, as Christina, you said you, you uh, advised using um, Live View. Uh, you can magnify Live View yeah. if you want to get a little bit more accurate with focusing. So, all right. Hey, that um, was the Instagram challenge. Now we move on to the discussion. This is going to be pretty short, but I want to talk about this because I heard this on the New Zealand trip uh, some, and I think we're surrounded by it. I saw this picture uh, from uh, somebody I follow on Facebook the other day. Facebook decided I should see this picture. So I um, saw this picture. My goal is not to be better than anyone else, but to be better than I used to be. And I said, right on, Dr. Wayne Dyer, right on. Because here's what happens. We, especially Instagram users, I think, but, but it, well, anywhere you are, we are bombarded by awesome photos, majestic locations where um, the person has taken care to take a really nice photo, post-process it nicely, and it's gorgeous. And on the New Zealand trip, there were times where I heard people say, you know, actually like showed pictures that had been taken at that location and were kind of like, I don't feel like I should even bother. That's what those people were saying. Um, actually, just one person. So that, so what? There's always going to be people that are better than you that are able to produce. You don't know. Here's what I always tell myself about everybody who's better than me. They're a trust fund baby. They got all their money so they could just go sit at that location. I don't really always say that. Because everything that makes people better at it than others is money. Well, that's the only thing that ever makes anything better. I know. That's why I don't always say that. But um, but you, you just have no idea. And also they could they are going to be better than you. And you can't let that stop you from taking your photos. And so this really resonated with me. Your goal should be to look back at your photos you took a year ago or two years ago and look and, and be appreciative of your improvements. Don't look at this guy's Instagram photos or that guy or that girl or that dog's, because dogs can take pictures now too. Don't look at their pictures. And, well, actually if a dog takes better pictures, but no, don't look at their pictures and say, oh, why bother? You are bothering because you want to improve yourself. That's all. Anything to add? Uh, no, I think you're totally right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's, it's tough. I know it's tough. I look at some of these Instagram pictures and I'm like, 
daggone, that's a beautiful picture. But go out and make a picture that's yours and be proud of it. Yeah. Okay. Comparison is a thief of joy. Did you just come up with it? No. Where's it from? It's like one of the most popular quotes ever. Oh. I believe it's by Thomas Jefferson. Hmm. Some big person in history. I mean, the chat room can tell us. Some big person. Big as in like fat? Because that would be Benjamin Franklin. He was kind of chubby. Or do you mean big as in like Definitely a big role? Like like an important person in history. Right. Okay. That's... Okay. Hey, we got some questions to answer because this is the part of the show where we answer some questions for a few minutes. Then we roll into the after show where we continue to answer questions. And if you're watching live, you get to watch that. If you're not watching live, um, then you have to be a Patreon member to see all of that fun stuff that happens in the Mishmash after show. Pat Dinko wants to know, Christina, this is for you. Do you have a favorite Insta or Polaroid camera? Uh, sure. Um, I like the Fuji, so like current that are actually being produced still. Um, the Fuji, the, the piano black version, which is like the, it has the horizontal um, Insta, not the in instant picture. So they make the vertical ones and then they make the horizontal ones. And the, vertic the vertical ones are cool, but they're puny. Um, and the horizontal ones are nice and big. So I like that one. That's the Fuji, it's a Fuji film Instax. Uh, it's the black one. Um, and old ones, I don't think I really have used many of them to, to say. But if you want to get an instant camera, that's a good one. I've also been kind of curious to try uh, the Polaroid printers, the instant printers. Those look really cool. Um, so, yeah, there's that. Bruno wants to know if I encountered the A6300 overheating in Florida. No, did not. In fact, um, talk to, is it Max? Um, that was the other great thing about being there with all these different people. I didn't have to do everything. I could, be a, I could ask these other people who are experts and have great YouTube channels and say, hey, did you test the overheating? And Max was like, yep. And no overheating issues that he experienced with it. So that's good. Some thumbs up, Sony. And we should say... Um, I've not gotten any overheating issues in my Sony since the update to firmware 3.0, which there is an even newer firmware. Uh, people were kind of excited about it this week, but it seems like it's mostly just to bring it uh, in line with the G lenses, uh, the phase detection. So it's not too exciting unless you have those G lenses. Um, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, so I think the overheating problems are mostly behind us, mostly behind us. Which is nice that, you know, again, they figured those things out in firmware, made, uh, made the pipelines, the bandwidth through them a little more efficient. I don't know, something better. Evas Essen wants to know the best Sony Primes. The 5518 is a fantastically sharp lens. Here's the thing, none of these, I don't know if you're talking crop or full frame. Um, none of these are, Chelsea Northrop had her A6300 overheat while taking photos? Wow. I didn't hear about that. Huh. I definitely didn't have any issues with that. And I walked around that Wynwood Walls. It was a hot day in the sun shooting with that camera. Um, I did not stress test it. As I said, I, I just relied on listening to Max, who sounded like stress test it, and I trust him. Uh, but I didn't have any, uh, any issues. Okay, sorry. Back to this question. Best Sony's Prime. 55 F1.8 is a great lens. The 90 F2.8 is a fantastic lens. The 35 one. It's hard to pick a best because they all are quite good. All of the Sony Primes are very good. Some values are a little bit better than others. I love walking around with a 35 2.8. It's only a 2.8, but it is tiny and it is sharp wide open. I have a little mini review about that. So it depends on what focal length you're looking for. The easy answer kind of like will work on A6300 nicely and the A7 series, the 55. If you just want one great one, that's the one I'd pick. Okay. What's a South LA hiker? It's hot and dusty down there. What do you think about the Sigma 50 to 150 2.8 compared to the Sigma 50 to 100 1.8 without IS? I think the IS with the longer focal length would be more advantages. Uh, well, I haven't got my hands on the Sigma 50 to 100 f1.8 yet, but I can tell you without a doubt it is going to be noticeably sharper than that Sigma 50 150. The Sigma 150 
50 to 150 is a, is a decent lens, but it's not excitingly sharp. Um, it kind of depends on what kind of photography and shooting you're going to do. We walk into weddings um, and other than our 70 to 200, none of our lenses are stabilized and we're perfectly happy about that shooting with Canon, right? Or are you not listening? Not listening. Okay. I'm saying we don't use stabilized lenses in weddings really. Uh, other than except the, the 70 Except for the 70 200s if there's longer focal lengths. Um, which you can kind of argue the 50 to 100 is kind of like a crop sensor 70 to 200. Uh, but, you know, we've got cameras these days with higher IS. That's great for stills. But if you're shooting video and you want to do a little kind of run and gun style, then the IS is nicer. Um, so it really kind of depends on what you want. Absolute sharpness um, and a shorter range with a great aperture. Or, yeah, a little bit more of a versatile focal length and image stabilization. So that you could make the argument that that one probably is a little bit more versatile, but the other one's going to be so sharp. What size reflector, 32 or 43, Christina? 43. Yeah, I agree. Bigger the better. Um, Samron wants to know, do we have any tips for selling used gear and cameras? Uh, Amazon. I, us I usually sell my stuff on Amazon. You know, I used to say that a lot, and the last time I sold, what did I sell on Amazon? I sold the 7D Mark II on Amazon. Um, I, I used to say that because I was like, you know, scammers, you just put it up there, it sells. I got so many, well, not so many, like five or six people in the first week that were like, dear sir, will you wire me money, and then I'll wire you back twice as much to, Shh, F off, man, I'm just trying to sell a camera. Um, so I think Amazon is still my answer as far as the most painless, um, take nice pictures of it, uh, make sure it's nice. You might want to look at the Facebook groups. I haven't tried the Facebook groups. Any chat room? Do you have anything to say about them? I have a bunch of gear that I want to start getting rid of. And so I've been thinking about this myself. I, I really don't like eBay very much. Um, but I will say, kind of related to this, is buy used gear more often, folks. It is a good way to save. We talked about some tips, I think, on that last week. So we weren't going to go back to those. What's your opinion on going to college for a photography degree? Is hmm. it worth it? We've talked about this many, many times. Um, it really depends. I, I'll say this. I can see, like, I have people contact me from time to time about helping me with photography and they like send their portfolios and then I have people who contact me uh, and, and some of them have gone to photography school and some of them haven't and you can definitely tell the difference between the ones that have gone to photography school and the ones that haven't. That said, I strongly believe that you don't need to go to school and spend thousands and like tens of thousands of dollars to get a photography education. I think that it can help you appreciate art, which can then inspire you to become your own, to, to sort of do your own thing and create your own body of work. Um, so from that perspective and from the academic per perspective, I do think if you have the money, you should take advantage of it. However, getting into debt uh, is not something that I can necessarily vouch for or recommend. Um, you know, I think that you could try to apprentice. There's lots of really great online tools for education that you could, you know, just spend money on instead um, that are much smaller investment but that can help you with business and stuff. You, it's going to be really difficult for you to get an art education on the internet because you're not going to have those kinds of discussions that you would have in a college, in a classroom setting. Yeah. Um, so it kind of depends what you want to do with photography. Do you want to become an artist and be in a gallery and uh, just just be an artist, or do you want to be a commercial photographer, uh, which that is like weddings or portraits or whatever. Fashion, yeah. 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 So this is a, a thing we should discuss more because I'm sitting here. I used to work at a small college. There was a there is still a fantastic photography instructor there. I think about the students that went through that program. What some of them are doing now, as far as photography art um, it's really cool and so uh, exactly as Christina said depending on what you want to do for some people that makes a lot of sense if you're a very self-directed learner and or you can find an excellent photographer or photographers in your area to apprentice with there is a lot of strength in that as well so we should come back and try to talk about this at some point in the future but you know what I think that's all of this show we're gonna do right now 
crate. <laughs> I, I think eight. you've been ready for the end about one minute after we started. All right. Um, we're now moving into the after show, which I mentioned is available live right now if you're watching, or if I screw up like I did last week and make it public for a while. But for most times and most people, it is only available to our Patreon members. These are the wonderful folks, many of them are in the chat room, that every day I say thank you. When I went and did my taxes and I'm looking at diminishing returns from YouTube and certain advertisers, and I look at my Patreon and I say, thank you. You are making parts of the show literally possible. And I hope you're finding value in the support group that you have. And I'm also advertising to people who aren't in there. There are wonderful people in there that answer questions. You've got all of these great questions you're throwing at us. I see more in the chat room we're not going to get to. Why not become a sponsor, a Patreon member, and put them into the group where you'll get lots of great opinions, sometimes too many. Um, as Ann found this week when she's trying to decide on the next telephoto lens. Um, you also get access to our Lightroom videos, which we've talked about pouring our heart and soul into that teaches you Lightroom from the very beginning of installing it to the first time you bring in pictures to editing portraits with a professional portrait photographer. That's all in there and more and access to this after show that we're about to cut to. So I'll stop there. Somebody complained last week that this show was an infomercial. I really feel like we just gave people over an hour of content, and if we counted up how much time we spent talking about Lumoid, Patreon, and I mentioned you could travel with me, which is just freaking awesome, that's probably about five minutes. Yeah. And whatever, like skip the ads if you really don't want to see them. You know, well, we got to eat. <laughs> so. Yep, we got to eat. On that note, we're going to move into the after show. Thanks so much for watching. Riley's got to eat. Riley's got to eat. We all got to eat. He's going to make, we're going to make him share his yogurt with us. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. We'll see you in a minute.